Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a speaker series, uh, our alumni speaker series. My name is Liz Mangami, and I am the director of the advancement office here at Waterford. We're having one of those days where we're wearing way too many hats and I'm having to be three people in one. So thank you for your patience and grace. And I will get us started off. Um, this afternoon's program is a very special program for us in the advancement office because it allows us to bring together alumni and our current students. It it's really important for us to begin cultivating our students as future alums and it's also really um, essential for them to have a vision of what they will look like, what they will become when they finally become alumni who receive emails and appeals from the advancement office almost every other month. So we're really excited for this opportunity where we've managed to bring together alumni from the UWC Mozambique National Committee, many of whom are ex-Waterfordians in addition to being UWC alums. And today is ex essentially special because we also have Ms. Josina Machel, who was running around the, hill, the fields uh, up on this hill in 1995 and has also agreed to join us in this um, very special moment for both Waterford and the Mozambique National Committee because we're taking a moment to celebrate the long relationship that Waterford has with the country of Mozambique. Many people don't know the connections and we hope that through the series and with an a few other series that will follow on, we will be able to share with you just how important the country of Mozambique is and the citizens of Mozambique to Waterford's history and legacy. Um, I am honored to be able to also speak about the number of people who have uh, been involved in putting this um, event together. And I would like to make mention of our IB2s who are the heads of Women's Week, and that is Endeswa Memwa, Dejeuner Hargis and Phoebe O'Wall will be the uh, head of Women's Week who will be um, interviewing or dialoguing rather with Miss Michelle this afternoon. We decided to put these um, groups together because as many of you will remember, March is Women's Month and we are looking to celebrate women and we thought that Josina would um, do us the honor of representing all women today, as well as her identity as a Mozambican, as we also honor and celebrate our relationship with Mozambique, and in particular, a scholarship that we have here at uh, Waterford, which was established in honor of Fernando Honwana, who, is a, who was a Mozambican and one of the head boys at Waterford and somebody who has special meaning for our Mozambican um, alumni. And I will allow uh, my colleague Sharon Ramarini, who's also a Waterford alum, to welcome you on behalf of the Mozambique National Committee and also tell you a little bit about why today is a special gathering. Thank you for all of you for attending. I know that four o'clock Southern African time is not necessarily the best time for people to be on a Zoom call, but I appreciate those of you who've taken the time to join us today. And I look forward to the discussion that we're going to engage in. Thank you again and welcome. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon to all. Um, on behalf of the Mozambique National Committee, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Waterford Kamklaba for organizing this um, uh, amazing event. I am proud of the hard work our team has put into creating Mozambique's first NC, which has been something that has been long overdue for sure. Uh, we formed a national committee in September of 2016 well, with the main objective to ensure a wider representation of Mozambican applicants and provide them the opportunity um, to access this global and diverse community. The principles and values proclaimed uh, by UWC, namely peace, 
tolerance, understanding of mutual inclusion and non-discrimination are today the fundamental objectives that we as an NC stand for and promote in the country and in our community. <clears throat> as mentioned, we are a young NC. There is still much work to be done. Over the past five years, we have been able to send a limited number of students to the various colleges, even though demands of our students has been of great interest, which we are really proud of. This is also due to the lack of, of funding. Although funding has been limited, uh, we are still proud of the representation of our students at the various UWCs. Um, our hope for the future as an association is to continue to provide opportunities for most and hopefully be the next change makers for, for the country. Thank you and good, uh, good luck to the success of the event. Um, now I would like us to watch a quick video from the Advancement Office. I believe they will start sharing the screen at the moment. The relationship between Mozambique and Waterford started since inception of Waterford Gonzaga. Fernando Honwana was the first Mozambican student to attend the school, in a school where the Gage family played a crucial part in the existence of the school. Thank you so much for that amazing video. It was very informative. I would like to introduce Arminio Quellas to give us a presentation on the scholarship and its appeal. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Greetings to everyone. Can you hear me? Some thumbs up with me, yes. <laughs> yes, we okay. can. Brilliant, spectacular. I think that this COVID thing is making us all uh, at least more masters of technology 
but uh, every so often technology doesn't quite work the way we want. So we're just double checking. Okay, my name is Nuno. I know we've got a packed day, so I want, I will be short. Um, as Sharon was mentioning, we initiated the process of setting up a national committee in maybe 2015 or so, and it came to fruition a bit later. We've now been running for about four or five years. And uh, while small, we have now been able to put eight kids through the process of uh, the final two years of uh, the IB. The intention is to roll out the program that we can put two to three students, maybe four, through this on an ongoing basis. We have no time horizon for how long this should continue for. If possible, we'd like to continue for perpetuity. Uh, the first relationship we established was with Waterford. Uh, Mozambique has probably about 50 or so students that have gone through Waterford in the past 50 years since uh, Waterford was started. And so we, we do feel a very strong connection. Uh, I think from the video you saw, you can see the connection is quite profound. And from what I hear from uh, Fernando Juana's eldest brother, Bernardo, was that a lot of these discussions were happening in Mozambique already uh, around the issue of independence, a multicultural environment for people to, to engage and get educated in. And for the people that accompanied, accompanied Waterford in the, in, the, in the first years, and for sure through to the time that I was around, was still a very politically induced uh, environment uh, where a lot of the, the people from the vicinity were spending time and sending their kids. And so, uh, and I think from the video, you can see that uh, Pancho Getsch was uh, an influential person. He's an architect for those that were not familiar with. And for those that have spent time schooling at Waterford, uh, what I heard was that the school was intended to be in Mozambique, but we were still at a colonial system. And so Swaziland became the location. Now that building for those that have spent that is very cold. Now, Mobuto has a temperature of 40 degrees, and I think that building was contemplated for, for our environment, you know? Uh, Swaziland, especially water for the top of the mountain, is a substantially different circumstance. So if you didn't get those seats next to the hot pipe in the morning, uh, and there were only four of those in every classroom, you were struggling pretty much the rest of the day, you know? Um, but so, um, you know, myself, I'm, I went to Waterford, and, um, We've got a big community here. Obviously, we want to give back. And so we started this association. Uh, we've been able to get some local partners on board from a financing perspective. And what we're doing at the moment is we're getting about two or three scholarships annually. Waterford is committing to one annually to us for the next X amount of years. And then we also get it from other colleges around the world. And what we are doing as an association is that we're raising capital to be able to pay the rest of the, the costs associated with having these kids uh, you know, go to school in a different uh, geographical location. Um, and so, this, but, but I know that today's event is predominantly about uh, Fernando Juana. Uh, what if Fred has committed to supporting us? But we're also aware that you know, they, they also have you know, budget limitations. So, you know, obviously, the, the, we want to try and secure as much support from the wider community as possible um, to, keep, to keep this going. Uh, going back to the relationship of uh, Waterford to Mozambique, one of the things that the association wants to look into as well is actually compiling a book with the history uh, over the last 60 years or so that this relationship has been around, uh, which I think will be useful not only for Mozambicans, but also for, for the whole of the, for Waterford, but also for the, for the UWC. I think that there's very few schools like Waterford that played such a crucial role in the, the transformation that happened in, in, in a specific part of the world. Yeah? And so this needs to be captured and they still we need to take advantage of a lot of people that are still with us, that have a fresh memory and can give us some insights that are you know, more than half a century old. You know, we need to collect this information you know, and we would like to do that into a book which uh, it's a dream of ours, and when we have it, we'll share it with you. Now, as regard to Fernando Anwana himself, uh, he was the first Mozambican uh, to attend uh, Waterford. Um, 
He, I am very, I guess, you know, the Mozambican community, we, we all quite know each other. I was, one of my best friends is actually Ozzy, which is uh, Fernando's eldest son. We went, we started working for it the same year uh, in, in 1990, a long time ago. Uh, and, uh, and so when we were able to, when we were able to establish this relationship with Waterford, uh, we obviously brought to the attention of the Waterford uh, senior team as to the role, who Fernando Almuane had been and the role that he had played in Mozambique and the region. And uh, it was with much satisfaction to us that they decided to honor that scholarship with his name. Um, some of you might know a bit about Fernando Almuane, some might not. So I actually had some bullet points, but I came across this article written by a gentleman called Alan Isaacman, who's a history professor at the University of Minnesota. And I think he describes, this was written at the time that Fernando Almuane passed away in 96, 1986 uh, in a tragic uh, airplane accident um, at a very complex political time in our region. Uh, but, but I just I thought I'd read a few, a few of, of what he wrote just for you to be familiar with who Fernando Juana was. Um, so these are not my words. I'm quoting I, Alan Eisman, Isaacman, but I think he puts quite well. Um, at 36, Fernando Juana had already given so much of his, to his country and had so much more to give. He brought youthful energy, mature judgment, and unfailing loyalty to his position of senior advisor in confidant to Mozambique's late president, Samara Michel. A man of enormous intellect with a probing mind, Fernando was always ready to challenge, received wisdom when it did not correspond to the Mozambican reality and Frelimo's socialist agenda. President Chisano said it best. He was a brilliant and lucid intellectual and a respected leader loved for his competence and humanism. Frelimo's leaders quickly came to appreciate Fernando's rare combination of critical inquiry and dedication. While still in his 20s, he was sent to represent Mozambique in the Lancaster House negotiations, which resulted in Zimbabwean independence. In addition to his frequent trips to Harare, Fernando went on strategic missions to the countries, to countries ranging from North Korea to the United States. Fernando Juana was born on November 24, 1951, in Mwamba district. He came from a southern Mozambican family that was both fiercely proud of its African identity and deeply committed to breaking the chains of colonial oppression. An outstanding student, he was one of a handful of Africans to receive a higher education. He completed secondary school at Waterford in Swaziland and won a scholarship to, to York University in England from which he graduated in 1973. It goes on to say a few other things, but to summarize them, uh, in death, Fernando left behind a proud family who not only mourned his loss, but as for Limo members, continued to struggle for the just society. Those of us who knew and loved Fernando will miss his radiant smile, with sense of humor and penetrating intellect. People such as Fernando are rare indeed. So having read this, I think that, you know, I myself that uh, I'm Mozambican, just reading it again, it's something that, you know, obviously makes us very proud to have had a person like him, uh, not only as the first Mozambican at Waterford, but also as part of the, the leadership of our country. Um, and what, and what, and what is, is, is comes across is Ozzy, his son, is my age, about 42, and the values that Ozzy has, he lost his father when he was eight years old, uh, are still there. And I think those are values that our institutions like the United World College and Waterford, that instill those in people. Those values are so profound that even they get, they, they, they become so intrinsic to you that it's inevitable that you share with everyone across you and the people that you socialize with. And Ozzy, even though he shared so little time with his dad, 40, 30 something years later, is still a person of such, in most of what I'm reading here about Fernando Juana, I could say the same thing about Ozzy, yeah? Uh, Ozzy then also went to Waterford. And I think this is the society that we hope to, to, to be creating, to be replicating, to be increasing. 
And uh, as we continue on with this conversation, uh, and as we in Mozambique continue this association, we want to try and increase the amount of people that we can put through such a, a learning academy, not only from an academic point of view, but more than that, from a human uh, perspective, uh, where we can learn to share with each other differences and find common grounds, that we can be human in our decisions. We don't have to use our intellect to win, but to create a more just environment for the rest of the people that don't have the privilege we have. And uh, with those parting words, I think I'd just like to thank everyone and uh, ensure you all that we are on a journey that will continue to hopefully grow and bring more students into our community. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. This is just a brief reminder that um, the chat is still open. And if you have um, any questions, do make sure that you note them down and save them for later. We will open the floor. And it is my honor and privilege to now hand over to Phoebe, who will continue the rest of the program. Hello, everybody. As introduced, my name is Phoebe Owu. I'm an IB2 student and I'm from Uganda. I'm also one of this year's Women's Week heads. And the theme of this year's Women's Week has been intersectionality. What that is and how we can use it to bring about greater understanding in terms of liberation. It is my honor and immense privilege to have the opportunity to have this conversation with you, Ms. Michelle. As a team, we greatly look up to all the work you do in terms of activism for women in our Southern African context. However, we have found ourselves wondering what your experience at Waterford must have looked like. So um, what was it like going to Waterford as part of the first family? Do you believe that your experience was dramatically different to the average student? Hmm. Hello, Phoebe. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, indeed quite interesting to look at you and think about myself around 26 years ago in Waterford, um, being at uh, the beginning of my youth and having the ability to have such an education, but most importantly, be in a school of such diversity and indeed a small microcosm of the world. I would like to thank Waterford for inviting me uh, to have this conversation today. It is um, more no nerve wracking than I thought it would be, you know, I tend to um, engage with <laughs> quite a number of institutions and uh, leaders around the world, but going back to your school and talking can be quite uh, nerve wracking, but I'd like to thank for this opportunity. Um, it has made me reflect indeed on what my experience at Waterford has been. And as I was going around and just check, seeing who is participating here, I think I actually saw Ms. Ramila Patel, who was a teacher at that time. And I'd like to say hello, and it's good to see you today. Um, starting our conversation, Phoebe, um, being in Waterford was quite an experience. I was coming out of Mozambique. I had already done 12 years of school and um, I was, uh, my mom put me in Waterford so that I could start interact, interacting or get introduced rather to um, education in English. I had studied in Portuguese throughout. And at the time, I was dreaming of becoming um, a dancer and a psychologist. I wanted to major in dance psychology because I wanted to engage with young people. At the time, there was quite a rise in drug use in Mozambique. And um, I thought it would be interesting to have to offer the possibility of healing through dance because it does not force you to, to speak much, but it gets to the root of your pain, of your struggle, and it gets to healing through movement. And so um, went to Waterford 
And after the two years, I ended up changing my mind and I went and studied something else. Nunu said it quite in, quite well. You know, if you didn't wake up early and you didn't make sure and you, you didn't make sure that you were in the warmer parts of the classroom in time, that was it for the day. And it was quite a, a, a difference from Maputo because Maputo is indeed quite warm. But for me, what was really um, an eye opener was the diversity. You know, being in an environment where um, there were children from young people rather from China, from Australia, from the US. Um, I made um, lifelong friends from Ghana and from Kenya, for example, from Angola. And that was really just a, a, an amazing um, eye opener to what the world is. Understand that after I went to Waterford, I then came to South Africa, to UCT. And South Africa in 1996, 1996 was very different from the world, you know, and in, in terms of diversity was exactly a, a contrast. And I was so glad that I had experienced Waterford, number one, academically, because it's uh, an excellent um, institution, but one of the things that marked me was the community service. We had to go, you know, when we were doing at the time, I don't know what is being offered now, but I took, for example, the vision and hearing testings in the community and we would go back, we would go down to Mbabane and, you know, to go around and do that. That has actually marked me. And when I started studying sociology, I was very much then taken to issues of community and something that could be actually applied um, in the community. You asked whether um, it was a different experience from uh, because of my background. Absolutely not. Um, I'm sure the way you experience Waterford, everybody is, is quite equal. Um, you know, you wake up early, go to the showers, you are in class. If you're not, your teachers are as hard as they need to be. Breakfast is the same. Yes, of course, in IB, we enjoy a bit more privileges. You know, we can have a bit of an egg here and there. Um, in the kitchenette, but absolutely, um, it was it was for me a forming experience. Forming, um, it form started forming my identity. I had never been to boarding school uh, before, so sharing bathrooms was quite something. <laughs> it was quite one of those experiences that marked me. Um, and just sharing spaces and learning about everybody. But uh, I experienced, I, I believe that I experienced like everybody did. Yeah. Um, Manny, you mentioned diversity. And this year, Waterford has its first female principal, and she's a woman of color. And that kind of female representation in a position of power is so important for younger girls to grow up around. And I was just wondering if you believe that having a female principal can change how young women think of themselves in professional careers. Absolutely. Um, you know, female representation in all sectors of, of power and authority are very important to the way we as young girls or women in general look at the world. Um, having women in leadership positions allows us to believe that it is possible. It allows us to know that it is possible and that women can actually do as successful as men do. I had a conversation um, a week, around 10 days ago, with the president of Estonia when uh, at the opening of the um, commission of the status of women. And she was actually talking about the experience of young girls at kindergarten in Estonia now, because Estonia is one of those few countries where you have a president and uh, a, a president that is a woman and a prime minister who's a woman. 
What it does to young children in kindergarten is that whenever they discuss where, what their future will be like, you know, there's no limit. So many of them these days, when they are in, in class with boys and, you know, between boys and girls, and the conversation is, okay, what are you going to do when you grow up? When the boys say, oh, I want to be president, the girls actually look at them and say, oh, but you are a boy. Do you see what, do you see what that does? So whereas for many of us, we grew up and say, like, oh, but you're a girl, you can't be president. In Estonia at this point, the, the, the children look at each other and go like, but you are a boy. So that is to demonstrate how leadership in all sectors of society, so being at our schools, in our communities, in our churches, for example, of course, in our workplaces, and of course, in political leadership, um, positions, they demonstrate that it is possible and allow women to know that there is no ceiling to their dreams, there is no ceiling to how they can participate effectively in our society. I think you answered that perfectly. I completely agree. I do think that um, that type of representation can be completely life-changing for anyone. And um, seeing women invited into spaces that we were previously not invited into is the result of years and years of activism by powerful revolutionaries. And activism today has transformed and adapted to fit this global era and this technological era um, that we currently live in. So perhaps a stranger question is, I was wondering what your views were on online activism in which younger people are taking to social media platforms like Instagram or Facebook to advocate for certain issues. Do you believe that this is effective or do you think it's more so performative? Absolutely um, life-changing and transforming. But I would like to start with something that you said. You said women being invited into spaces. Um, we need to redefine that. Women should not be invited. Women belong at the center of all these spaces. We are 50% of the population, 51% around the population of this world. So it is only, um, you know, it's only reasonable that there is representation, that there is um, equality because it can't be anywhere, it can't be any other way. So instead of us being invited, we need to, we actually need to be where we belong, at the center of discussions, at the center of, of, of decisions in the world. You know, the future for me is two things. The future is young, it's young people, and the future is female. So, um, the kind of activism that we see nowadays with young people like you and many others, it is absolutely transforming. It's disconcerting for those of us that are used to, to structure and to think that, well, activism needs to be, you know, you have an NGO, you've got an organization, and that is how you, 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 you advocate, that's how you implement programs and so on and so forth. The truth is young people have demonstrated that uh, 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 they need to be heard, they can be heard and they can bring transformation. You know, one of the things I, I one of the movements I admire the most is the one um, that started perhaps four years ago here in South Africa in one school in Pretoria where young girls, black young girls just decided that, listen, we want to go to school in our Afros. And when that was not allowed in schools, a whole movement had started to the point that look, look at some of us, we, not, we don't have the Afro as it is, but we, we wear natural hair, we put color, whatever it is. And it's just become acceptable and it's a become um, acceptable and, and just is, you know? And those are the kind of things, you know, the, in the GBV, in the, in the, in the gender-based violence space, the young women that simply decided it's enough at, Ro at, um, at Rhodes University have changed this discourse on gender-based violence completely. You've got now, for example, four girls that started in Chile. 
they started a movement that went completely viral on social media in which they started a poem, a poem that said, you know what, violence is not about us. Violence is about the president that does not enact law, that does not give us the space to have laws. It's about the judge that does not enact the laws. It's about the policeman that doubts my pain. And it just went, you know, it started in Chile, it went to Australia, to the UK, to Spain, it's just gone global. And just that, that just demonstrates the power of social media, but the universality also of issues that we deal with as women, but you guys in particularly as young women. And I hope that that encourages you to know that you have the power to change. You have the ability where you are right now, Phoebe, you have the ability to say, I stand for something and I will ensure that my friends and that other people will also stand for what it is that they believe. I, I had never considered it like that. I feel like it's it's very easy to doubt the significance of um, something as small as social media and posting, but I think you do highlight something and a common misconception about um, social movements that do exist on the internet. So what are some other misconceptions people might have about you and other women in your line of work? And how do you think we can combat these misconceptions in order to communicate the significance of your work more effectively? The biggest misconception is, is that, um, so I, I became an activist around um, gender-based violence um, in a very unexpected way, right? So um, six years ago, I was in a very small space with um, someone that I had a relationship with and uh, we disagreed on uh, quite a small point and he became completely violent. Um, he, he beat me, um, gave me three blows to my face, one of which immediately blinded me. What I did, and it was instinctive, you know, has transformed my life and uh, I will get to your answer, but I need to explain, has transformed my life in different ways. The first one was that I started screaming and I was not embarrassed to scream about my pain and the fact that I'd been abused. I started screaming in public. I asked for help. Although I didn't get any, um, I did ask for it. Then when I was taken to a public hospital, I did not show away. I actually told the truth. I had been abused. I had been, been beat. I had been beaten up. The treatment that I got in those five hours, in which there was quite a lot of neglect from medical profession, um, and then eventually it rolled out into the police, and later on, um, you know, the legal case just became quite um, a process in itself and a challenge in itself. I then realized that many of us, women who are abused are silenced consistently. We are forced into silence by our abusers. We are forced into silence by our families at time. And I'm speaking generally, we are forced into silence by our families, by our, our, our friends, you know, our um, close knit and extended family, by our society in general. And then of course, by the structures and the powers that be. Because the option to talk about violence is one that you need to do consistently. If you don't do that, you end up being silenced in many ways. You know, when your documents disappear, for example, you might decide not to continue talking about it or, or, and to quit. When, um, uh, for example, your, your community denies it and treats you like an outcast, you might decide to stop screaming and not talking about it. So one of the biggest misconceptions is that our silence is because 
we agree with is with what is being done. The other big mix misconception is that we chose to be victims. And of course, then that by choosing to be victims, we also choose to remain victims and not transform ourselves into survivors. You see, um, so that is the biggest and the, the, the one that can shell you from the beginning and it might not allow you to continue talking about it to challenge the status quo and of course to then enable and create an environment that is caring that is understanding and most of most more, more than ever an environment that does not tolerate perpetration you know perpetrators of violence and violence in in communities the reason i talked about my screaming is because i started screaming at that time when i came out of a car and then i chose to continuously and consciously continue screaming in the names of all the women that are abused daily, that are killed daily, that are silenced daily, and that do not have the opportunity to continue giving their faces and screaming like I do at this point. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that with all of us. That's a deeply personal story and we are appreciative that you, were, you felt comfortable enough to share that experience you had. And on behalf of all the women, you sharing your story is um, you extending the opportunity for us to also share our stories and continue this fight towards a future that women can live without the fear of violence, whether that be in their familial relationships, the intimate relationships. So thank you for that. Um, another question I think I would want to ask you is, as a woman of color, you are faced with two systemic avenues of oppression, one being of color and the other being a woman. And Blackness is not a homogenous identity. Um, you're also a Mozambican woman and you're an African woman. And these two things are significant parts of your identity. So I was wondering how you believe that being an African woman has shaped the discourse of your life in terms of your profession, um, on an international level, a professional level, just just in general, being from the continent. Um, you know, in general, and I'm, I'm in general, being black, and for quite some time I was young too. So, <laughs> so being young black and uh, a woman brings the intersectionality that we were talking about. Um, of course, one experiences it in, in different ways. And depending on which part of the world you are, you experience it more than in others. So for example, um, the way I experienced my own blackness in 1996, between 1996 um, and 1998 um, in South Africa, in Cape Town at the time, you know, was quite different, but it forced me to get a consciousness about being black, being beautiful, being brilliant, being bold, and being allowed to be who I am. Of course, not many have that opportunity, um, but it comes, and, and, and I have to say that from my own background, having the ability to read, to educate myself, and also to hear stories about other women who have started this fight centuries ago. It always gave me the strength to say, at the center of everything and of all of us, there is humanity. And so it's a pity that others cannot see the humanity in me. And the loss is not mine. The loss is actually of those that cannot see the humanity in me. I think that's beautifully said. Thank you so much. Um, I think now I would open the floor to anyone who may have any questions for Ms. Michelle. We could use the chat function, or if you would like to speak, that's also an option. Hmm. 
Hmm. Before the questions come, you've thrown a very interesting question at me. Why don't you stay open? Oh, okay. No, it's coming. Hi. Sorry. Um, I think it would be very interesting for me as a geography teacher at Waterford and involved in admissions from Mozambique to get a Mozambican perspective on what's happening in northern Mozambique at the moment. There's a lot of will and desire amongst UWC to support refugees and internally displaced people. And I think it would be remiss of us not to talk about what's happening in northern Mozambique. Um, we've talked about violence, we've talked about women's rights, and I think northern Mozambique is a part of the world where these are really critical issues at the moment. So I just wondered whether we could have a Mozambican perspective on what's happening in the north of your country at the moment. Absolutely. Um, you know, a, a very short way of saying what's happening in Mozambique has um, would be a comparison to what is happening in many parts of Africa as soon as they discover natural resources. Um, the kind of uh, issues that we're facing now in Mozambique have been um, originated in the fact that there have been oil and gas discoveries. Um, and so uh, no, I wouldn't call remnants, but what the kind of destabilization that we have seen um, in Nigeria, we've seen in Libya, we've seen in, in, in Iraq even, um, you know, and what many of us, many have actually termed the, 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 the resource uh, curse, right, is exactly what's happening. You discover the resources, um, the government is involved in negotiations and to start planning um, effective development, long-term development, and then different forces descend upon us and this kind of destabilization starts. The humanitarian crisis is huge. We've got millions of people that have been displaced within that area. Um, and the government is trying to find solutions, of course, but it's very difficult um, to deal with the reality. They are already reports as well that they are a, a bit of tribalistic um, nuances to, to, to some of the issues and to some of the battles that are happening on the ground. So it is important, the, the most important thing is for all of us to continue putting pressure, of course, on the government, but keeping an eye on the, um, and also supporting uh, NGOs on the ground that number one, are able to give us adequate and accurate information on what is happening. And most importantly, giving us the reality exactly, or uh, the reality of what um, the humanitarian crisis is all about and solutions to it. Of course, displacement is not something that we can deal with immediately. We need to look at new solutions to ensure that these people are housed, they, um, they start a new life wherever they are. And so it involves, it requires actually the involvement of all of us um, inside the country, outside the country. And of course, making sure that the ones that profit from war do not continue doing so. Uh -huh. I see a question here from Catherine. Um, if I have any thoughts on how to challenge religious and cultural views that are anti-women, anti-gay, and anti-democratic. Um, indeed, I do have <laughs> very strong views on, on that. Um, you know, in, in many contexts um, in the world, in many contexts and in, very, in many continents in the world, um, a woman's experience is, you know, starts immediately when she's born. 
And, you know, the moment that you realize it's a girl or it's a boy, it determines exactly how you will be treated for the rest of your life, whether you have going to have access to education, whether you're not, whether you're going to get married, um, you know, and whether you, you have the ability to choose who's going to marry you and when who's going to marry you, when you're going to have children, and so on and so forth. Um, and these are, of course, perpetuated by very strong cultural views. And what we need to do, uh, we all need to do, is to start challenging it. Of course, I don't, I am not someone that goes against culture. I recognize the impact of culture in shaping us and, and in giving us our own identity. However, there are elements, there are factors within our culture that need to be challenged. And the way we challenge this is not from an outside view coming in and saying this is wrong, but it has to be in understanding the reason behind, the reason, for example, certain practices have been put in place and engaging with what I call custodians of culture. And those would be the traditional leaders, the traditional healers, the matrons in our community, you know, those old ladies that um, perform various rituals and are recognized as decision makers in our communities and engaging with them and helping them ask the question, say, what do these practices serve? And when we identify that and say, okay, perhaps they are good things that good values that they perpetuate in identity, but the way they're being done um, are harming. For example, if we're talking about female genital mutilation, there can be ways of introducing girls to um, introducing girls to womanhood that do not involve the cut. And it has been shown in different parts of the world that those kind of processes can be done. So of course we need to challenge, um, and of course religion when it comes to gender-based violence, um, we've been engaging with religious leaders and there has been quite a lot of progress lately and we, and we see them adopting um, this cause. But you know, we have to go to the origin. I once said in the United States and people were quite shocked. I said, you know, the or original sin started actually when Adam looks at Eve and you know, when God comes and says, Adam, what happened? And uh, Adam looks at, and looks at Eve and says, she made me do it, you see, and that's where we need to start also interrogating the interrogating the Bible, the interpretations of the Bible, the roles that have in justifying a number of discriminatory attitudes, behaviors, and practices against women, against gays, um, and against um, you know fruitful contribution and participation in our in our community. Thank you for that answer, Ms. Michelle. Just to finish up this Q&A section, we have one final question from Mr. Andrew Keith, who asks, what values and or philosophies did you embrace at Waterford that you hope will continue to guide the school and its community in the future? Sorry, Bajia, can you repeat the question? What values or philosophies did you embrace at Waterford that you hope we will that you hope will continue to guide the school and the community in the future. Absolutely, the the the, the appreciation for education, um, and not just the academic excellence, but um, the ability to start uh, questioning life, questioning. Um, whatever is right and whatever is not right. You know, one of the subjects that for me was very challenging at, at um, Waterford was theory of knowledge. <laughs> and it was difficult, you know, I dreaded the Thursday evening classes. I'll, at times I would sit and almost start crying saying, oh my God, what is this all about? But you know, it's something that has shaped um, me in terms of number one, questioning issues, um, looking at various um, hypotheses and various angles to the same question. And um, of course, you know, allowing others also to have different views on, on, on subjects. 
And, but the most important for me that I took out of Waterford and has carried me through, I actually wanted to bring my daughter to Waterford a few years ago, but then she changed her mind. But it was the aspect of diversity and, and being able to experience different cultures, to understand how they look at life, how they value life and how they contribute um, to life. And as I'd said before, was also um, the values instilled in community participation and community um, in service of your community. That has stayed with me um, until, until today. And that's why I decided um, to stand for a cause and to serve uh, women who have been abused and don't have the courage yet um, to speak out. And I would like um, to, to thank, you know, this um, relationship that started between Mozambique and Waterford almost 60 years ago and has opened the possibility for many of us to actually do the bridge in education from a Mozambican system, for example, to a more um, inquisitive, more questioning, more opening system. Um, but most important to the quality of education that we have been exposed at um, and at Waterford. And therefore, when I was asked to speak to today and to have this conversation, I could not, I couldn't even find them saying, saying no. And it was, of course, also a way of honoring, um, um, honoring, um, Fernando Wangwana, who for me was an uncle. I used to call him Uncle Fernando Wangwana. I had the privilege of uh, growing up um, with him. Of course, when he died, I was 10 years old. I became very close to, to, to Ozzy and to Deke as well. And so this is a family that has played quite a significant role, you know. Uh, Fernando Wangwana was an advisor to President Samara Machel, and I saw and I heard later on also the role that he played, not just in peace process, in the peace process in Mozambique, in the peace process in the Zimbabwean process, but also um, there are books that need still to be written in this region. And the books will not be complete if the name of, of um, Fernando Wangwana is not there because he influenced also negotiations with the ANC um, and the process of independence of, of, of South Africa, freedom to South Africa and to Namibia. And so this is a giant that we are honoring today and that we are ensuring that his name will continue in perpetuity in Waterford because we, as far as we know, he was the first Mozambican there and he opened the avenues for many of us and many others that will come to have access to this unique experience that Waterford Kamshaba gives us. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to have this conversation with me, Ms. Michelle. Um, and thank you for all the work you do for women internationally and in this context. It's greatly appreciated. So thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate having the conversation with you. I hope we can continue having the conversation. Um, you know, my email is open and it's um, allowed to be used. Uh, my number as well. I can sense quite a strength in you, quite strength in you. And I am sure you're going to become a young leader for us to look into the future. So a lot of strength and a lot of strength to your friends as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Michelle. Now, if I could please introduce um, our next speaker, Dr. Musimbi Kenyoro, who's going to speak to us about the power of scholarship. Dr. Kenyoro, whenever you're ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. 
I didn't hear your introduction. Would you repeat it again, please? I was briefly introducing you and saying you're gonna to speak to us about the power of scholarship. Thank you very much. First of all, I just want to appreciate um, your invitation for me to participate and specifically for having just listened to the previous uh, speaker and yourself introducing the session and asking the questions. Thank you so much. And I so much resonated both with the questions and the answers uh, uh, from Jacina. Thank you so much. It's really a privilege to have listened to it. Uh, so I, I want to um, begin you know, to talk very briefly so we can have some question and answer, which is better. Just from a personal experience, because experience, as we often say, in feminist thinking that when we speak from experience, we speak from a reality that is not questionable. Um, I grew up in a family that was interested in education, but probably we would not have been able to afford as um, um, much education as we wanted because of financial reasons. But my parents had a vision which they shared with all of us saying, you got to do your best. And if you do your best, there'll be an answer. They didn't know what they, where that answer would come from. But basically they believed that if um, um, there is a possibility for succeeding in working hard, there might be ways in which scholarship, um, scholarship here, I'm using it fast in the sense of getting somebody to pay for your, um, um, way to school, scholarships might come by. And luckily we grew up at a time when scholarships were available either from governments or from elsewhere for students that would be able to make it. So the end part, if I come to the end part of it is that um, I was lucky to have been one of the students that got scholarships, a scholarship to go to university and then a loan from the government to do my, um, undergraduate work. And what we used for the loan actually that we got, my sisters and I who are older, was we decided that we wouldn't buy what was needed in the schools such as books, etc., but we'd go to the library because we saw the needs that awaited those that were younger than us, but also other members of the family who we knew might not be able to make it without support in um, uh, scholarships as money for schools. Um, and so we did that and we supported the younger ones and not only from our family, but beyond. And, um, uh, and later on in life, I accompanied my, ma my mother who also uh, raised funds to support kids to go to school. Why is this important? I think it's important because when one is gifted with education, that is the one thing that no one can take away from you. And that's where power comes from. Everything that uh, our sister Justina said about getting self-empowerment, being confident in yourself, understanding how we balance between what we are offered in culture, what we are offered in religion, what we are offered in um, international um, affairs, what we are offered through even protocols that we get at the United Nations, like uh, an example for protocols of the United Nations is sustainable development goals. To be able to filter through and find one's role that you can play wherever you are as a teacher, as a student, as a, an activist, as an administrator, really is backed by having an education and here, education is more than the alphabet that you learn in school or the numericals that we are offered um, in schools in mathematics, et cetera. It is education for me is what we got in, for example, um, organizations that came into the school and taught us first aid, uh, which we could apply even in our own homes in the villages what we got by being also members of uh, the mountaineering club, 
that enabled us, even as young people, to be able to appreciate what we have in our own region in Mount Kenya and Mount Kilimanjaro and have opportunity to climb those mountains before. Um, for me, that's power, to be able to see a bigger picture. What we got by having extracurriculum information on the protection of wildlife, because that had prepared us for what we see today when we see the destruction that is there of the environment and wildlife. Because earlier on, an education was given to us that helped us to appreciate how nature is connected and how we can be participant in keeping it safe and keeping it right. And the benefits of either that nature becoming a beauty that people see through tourism or a balancing of uh, other things that we will be able to produce from the land. This is scholarship. This is the, the ability to be able to, um, to be exposed. And um, when that power of scholarship is accompanied by the kind of privileges that we have in UWC schools, for example, meaning able to be learn with others, to learn in a place where you can see what's important to, the, to your family, you can see what's important to your own culture, you can see what is important to other people's culture. As we often say at home, is that once you have tested food that is cooked by other mothers, you realize how to value your mom's cooking, but at the same time, how to understand that there are so many mothers and these mothers can be mothers to all of us. So these are some of the ways in which I see. But then there's scholarship. I wanted to look at scholarship from another perspective. Scholarship in the sense of the power of scholarship, in the sense of what we learn. It's one thing to be enabled financially to obtain education and to have opportunities to just do the things that I, I, learned, I, I learned. But it's another thing for every individual that has had this opportunity to use that scholarship, and here I'm saying that learning, to translate it into becoming a big change maker. I considered what Justina said as exactly that ability of using her scholarship, her exposure, her conscientization to be able to say, I do not have to be silent about violence in my life. And if I speak up, not only will it be helpful to me, but it could be helpful for others. We use scholarship by getting the confidence that we become advocates, not only for self, but ad advocates for the others. And then we use scholarships to write about things we believe in. We use scholarship to interact with others. We use scholarship to avoid getting into uh, spaces and conversations that sometimes cause problems but do not provide solutions. We can use scholarship to be able to see things that are going bad and become the kind of change agents that want to transform those things that are going bad. To value, um, if, even in our cultures, as Jacina said to us, to understand what to value and to treasure and to understand what we must trash because it's not good for us. So I think that's probably enough of what I wanted to say in introducing this way in which I understand scholarship, both as resources that support what we have to get, money in this case, and other ways, um, but also being able to utilize what we have learned um, um, as a part of this is, uh, this is the scholarship, this is what I learned, and this is how I'm going to use it. So with that, I, I want to, um, I, I'm, I'm open if you have any questions. Thank you so, so much for, um, I believe, the wonderful, wonderful presentation about um, exactly what the power of the scholarship is. And I think as a young woman and as a woman who's aspiring to do so much better, not just around me in my community and just like for the people I know and my country, I think one thing that you said that really just stuck is the fact that you know when we speak from experience we are speaking from a reality that cannot be questioned and as the moment even though this might not be a question but 
at this very moment as a young girl growing up in southern africa growing up in eswatini who is reading the headlines each and every day and all i can see every other day is headlines around gender based violence and i believe i am so touched every single day that there's not one moment that goes past that i do not wonder how can we change the situation how can we begin to question all these things how can how do we begin to question religion culture tradition here in this place and i think the first thing to do is to start by declaring gender based violence as a national emergency because when you look at the statistics they're actually scary as a young woman living in eswatini when you start to see that this thing is so real and it's in my face and you know you never want it to be you but you cannot ex- like explain and you know escape the fact that it could be someone you know it could be a sibling it could be a sister it could be your friends and i just think um it's one thing that is worthy of mentioning and just to also thank um Jessina Michaels um i think what you said really touched me and as i was listening all i could think of is how significant it is to see ourselves in positions of power to see ourselves in positions where we can actually influence and effect and affect change and you know it gives me and especially many more young women you know the ability not just to dream and but you know to be able to envision and to make it a goal you know that i can achieve great things i can do so much more i can reach greater heights and you know those milestones that were so unachievable back then and those milestones that looked so far away are now so close and all i have to do is just take the gift of education and grab it with both hands and i think i'm just very very grateful and um on that note i would also like to thank and appreciate that today we are graced by so many wonderful people um firstly i would like to mention that we are graced with the presence of the governing council chair mr mark mills and the wk governors not only just them but the uwcio colleagues who are represented by um jens walterman and the babane reo we are so grateful and i think seeing everyone here just speaks to you know that we're actually doing something good and you know we're making the right moves and we can do better and i just i'm so grateful for this opportunity for this platform and to be able to go into every speaker series and take notes and notes that stick with me notes that you know define me and notes that end up being what i want to you know embody and be to not just my friends and colleagues but to my community so i'm absolutely grateful and on that note i would like to hand over to our wonderful wonderful principal i cannot say this enough it's always an honor to introduce our principal um because first of all she's a lovely lovely person and i just i find it so amazing and yeah i would like to hand over to her and yes thank you thank you so much i don't know how to follow that i don't know how to follow all of you strong strong women all of you strong black women who are in our presence here um young 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 souls and those not so young um thank you so much josina thank you so much um musimbi i you know we sometimes look up to those who are or we do look to those who are older and now that i am older i can only look to you all um it's a huge honor for me to have this position in this school but i also recognize the huge responsibility that i have to all of you all of the students all of the people who work here um the housekeepers the drivers the cooks the gardeners um the teachers people who work in offices and i have this enormous opportunity to even at this stage to be of service um and i 
I think that being the first female and first black woman um, to head the school, um, one, it's about time and um, after 60 years, and two, it maybe it's the right time. It's the right time for us to um, look forward, the right time for us to identify what it is that we stand for and not forget to engage with Josinas and the Josinas of uh, Waterford past. But also, as you will see, um, Musimbi and Josina, we have some wonderful young women present here who are very, very keen, with very keen minds. And how proud we all are to be with, with you um, today. Um, this is uh, just to wrap up the end of this session of having had the opportunity to be with two brave women um, speakers, both Josina and Musimbi, to have been part of a, a united intertwined moment that even though we are here virtually, we can embrace each other and move forward. And so on this continent, to be full of opportunity, but also be, to be intentional in the work that we do, all of us. Um, I would like us to be able to commit ourselves to understanding how education can and should be a pathway to social justice and equity, and that we have a huge responsibility to prepare our students, not only for their future, for our future, but for the present. Um, and I thank all the moderators, all the people who worked behind the scenes, the National Committee of Mozambique, the thanks to the technicians, to the Advancement Office, and our deep, deep gratitude to you, Musimbi, and to you, Josina. Um, you are great mo role models for us all and for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Um, thank you also to everyone who attended. Thank you for the chats and the questions. We thank you that you took time at four o'clock and decided to um, spend the rest of your evening with us. And we appreciate you so much. We also appreciate um, the Advancement Office and you know to be able to have a platform like this to do all these wonderful things. And I think more than anything, as I close and as we close this wonderful speaker series, it's just to say that, you know, we need to do more than just educate, but, you know, as young women and as people, we need to, you know, start questioning, we need to start challenging and we need to start demanding, you know, all these wonderful things and all these opportunities and, you know, we need to, you know, take up space and, you know, build tables. And even if we're not building tables, you know, take up space and just, you know, take a seat at the table and run with it. And I think over everything, I'd like to thank my co-moderator, um, Phoebe. Um, you've been great. <laughs> You're amazing. And I'm so grateful to be able to share the space with you. And um, thank you to everyone, to Josina, to Dr. Kanyoro, to Patricia, to every single person who is here. I am absolutely grateful. And on that note, um, I think this is the time to take to declare the speaker series sadly over. It's been wonderful. And we are so grateful. Thank you to everyone.